Good morning, everyone. I hope you guys are prepared for your coffee and you have water with your dogs. And today I have a special guest. Her name is Judy Luther, and she is owner and a very well educated and very well um, established behaviorist. Um, her website, Understanding Dogs. Dot us will give you a little bit more information but you know what why don't we introduce her so you guys know what we're talking about because today we're going to talk about how we can help people even dogs with aggression remotely so welcome Hi, Judy. how are you doing i'm great how are you we're good your coffee ready everybody's ready i'm ready mm -hmm. so <clears throat> tell me what you're doing first of all <clears throat> i was um, I got a notification on my Facebook page and you were doing a workshop and I was like, mm -hmm. hmm, interesting. One of those trainers who do relationship approach training. Like, right. Let's look at that a little bit. And I really liked your approach. We are Good. kind of in alignment mm -hmm. with um, seeing the family as a main reason dogs do things and they mm -hmm. do things for the family and the family right. educates them. But Mike to you. <laughs> yes. So relationship is the basis of a lot of behaviors that we see too. If you have a good relationship with your dog and your dog feels comfortable and safe, you're going to see behaviors in, improve if you have behaviors that you're concerned about. So I always like to first focus on what is going on in that home between the dog and the family. How does the dog feel? Is the dog comfortable and safe and secure, which is always the priority. Gotcha. I, I, I totally agree. Now, um, for many, how many years did you do that? Like, how did you start? What was your starting point? Well, I've been working with animals for over 27 years, but the relationship-based aspect of it has been a huge part of it, probably for about the past 10 years. And that just increased as we saw more and more research in canine cognition and learning more about how dogs actually function more than what we thought we knew. You know, it used to be that we didn't even think the dogs had emotions. I remember. Yeah. A of years ago, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. I remember um, doing a course one time and chickens were involved and I was holding my chicken and I was scratching her on the back of her little head and I was rocking her like a baby. And the lady teaching the class said, what are you doing? What is wrong with you? That chicken doesn't have any feelings or emotions inside I knew they did but that was so many you know not so many years ago when this lady was a very well established professional and behavior person as well so thankfully we know more now than what we did then and we're able to take that information and help our animals regardless of species yeah yeah um <laughs> now you see people in person and also you do online training Yes. How, how is this working for you? Well, the in-person training basically stopped with the pandemic. I, I won't go into people's homes. I don't think it would be fair to them or fair to anybody else involved. So I started doing solely virtual with the pandemic. And I had toyed with it probably over the last seven or eight years. I have some clients in Dubai. I have clients all over the world that couldn't come and see me but they wanted to learn about my approach. So I still did virtual. That was Skype back then. We weren't even doing Zoom <laughs> yeah, right. and a long time ago. Um, maybe I'm dating myself. But um, so I had a few of those and I knew how successful they were. And during that time period, I even had a virtual client that lived literally half a mile away from my home. And that was before, like I said, that was Skype time. And I saw huge successes in it. So fast forward to 2020, and we're not going into people's homes. And what I'm seeing is huge benefits from the virtual. And I think there's many reasons, but I'm, I'm seeing better benefits in most cases from the virtual than I do in person, which is nice. I totally agree with you. I remember my first session was in 2007 with a colleague in London who wanted to be anonymous because of the position he has. And the funny part was that I didn't know that she was a trainer. It showed up after mm. 
conversation. Okay. So I talk to another dog, and the other dog, and then one of the pictures. So, you know, the logo, uh, a specific logo. I don't want to go into more details on the dog's harness. And I was like, wait, why do you have a <laughs> harness on? Yeah. So, well, that's what I do. And I was like, oh, okay. So, and then actually, it was it was my first and longest session. We did two hours. Really? Of session. Wow. Would, kind of like, what would I, but it was kind of like, we just hit on that. We just had that mm -hmm. continuous conversation. We went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And all of a sudden I was like, okay, I think I got this. And she's like, what? Mm -hmm. I think what's going on. And she's like, oh my mm -hmm. God, you're so right. Yeah. And at some point I recognized it was kind of like, it hit me really hard that even professionals struggle with their own dogs, just like everybody mm -hmm. else oh, does. Yeah. Because we are biased right. sometimes with our own stuff. We cannot see things. Plus, I have seen of my perspective that many times, you know, trauma and relationships affect our dogs, just like it affects us. Absolutely. So you have a problem mm -hmm. with your partner, it affects the dog. You have a problem with the dog, it affects the partner. So it's kind of a closed system, and we have to see it as such. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, I, I, I recognize that. We have the, doing online training gives you so many opportunities and such a broad spectrum mm -hmm. to be in that moment in the person's close environment without actually being present right. and disturbing that situation. And well, I feel, and, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, go on. And and I feel that if you don't have a good relationship as a client uh, trainer relationship, you will not even have the ability to do online work with that particular person. If you guys don't have this right. honest perspective and kind of openness and feeling safe, like if you don't build right. a relationship with a client, you will not be able to build a relationship between the dog and the client, right? So what is your Absolutely. experience with that? So what I'm finding really interesting, and you know, after we had talked last week one day, I um, had something come to mind. One thing, that we know that's incredibly important to behavior is the environment. If I walk into your home, your environment has now changed, right? So it's going to take a little while for the dog to possibly adjust to that environment. Some dogs are all happy, thrilled, yay, somebody's here, but they have to come down from that before they're able to start thinking, right? Correct, correct. Uh, some dogs, aggressive dogs, it can, it can just Put them into a situation where they can't even function because their world has been mixed up now. Right, so right. in both of those cases, we have dogs that aren't ready to learn. They can't learn because of the environmental change. That's not 100% of the dogs, but, but it is a huge percentage. Maybe not everything, but um, the other thing I thought about after we talked is I was thinking about a client actually many, many clients, when I was doing in person and I would come up to their door and I'd knock on their door, no, I would hear no. a vacuum. <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, well, you know, I, what, you know, what do you do? You're kind of stuck. But I would hear a vacuum cleaner in the background. How many dogs are frightened by vacuum cleaners? How many dogs are disturbed by the sound, the noise, the movement? A lot of dogs don't like it. I, I'm probably going to say, I would say more dogs hate it versus dogs that deal with it, right? So now we're adding something else to the picture. I have a dog that's been terrorized by that machine going around the living room, right? So we're trigger stacking all over the place. And then what we can't control either is the person, pet parent, who's worried that I'm going to be you know, concerned if she has dust on her shelf and, oh, did I put those dishes away? And, you know, all these things that I could care less about. And, but that feeds to the dog, the dog's feeling those concerns, and those emotions of the pet parent. So there's a lot of, as you said, triggers stacking up and a lot of things hitting that dog that is deterring me from being able to do my job. And that makes it really rough. Online, those aren't, those aren't concerns. Those aren't issues when we're online. We may have, you know, somebody that's like, oh, I'm not sure how to use this computer program, but they're not doing that high of a degree of triggers for their dog or creating that many triggers, I should say. Gotcha. For those who just joined us, I'm Roman with Holistic Dog Training, and that's Judy with Understanding Dogs. 
dot us the dot us is important or <laughs> just something um and we're having actually chat with a coffee talking about is it possible to train a dog remotely who has aggression and what are the problems that come up with that what people likely will struggle and what likely we would struggle or is it really a struggle or is it a benefit from that and so we had kind of we had conversation a couple of days ago and i said you know what we need to kind of talk openly about that because it's kind of like a taboo i remember when i started mm -hmm. and i started talking about online training everybody making fun of me oh you cannot train a dog online you need to be there seeing the aggression yeah. and seeing that extensive and i says i don't i don't care about the about the drama what i care is about mm -hmm. the trauma that's what I'm looking for. And if I see a behavior right. end result, it doesn't mean I have to deal with that because the root is somewhere mm -hmm. else. So why do we start there and don't start at the root right in the beginning? And I don't have to physically right. be there because the root doesn't show up right that moment. It happened in the past. Mm -hmm. So there's what I have to look yeah. for. So well, what, and, what, and what's your experience on that? Well, I hear people all the time say to me, okay, so I'm going to set this up so he aggresses so you can see what he's doing. <laughs> and I said, wait, but wait a minute. I, I trust you as the guardian of this pet to provide me the information that you've seen. I don't need to see it. I don't need to stress your dog. And I don't need your dog to practice behaviors that we don't want. So I take a really thorough history from clients before I interact with them regarding the dog's behavior. And I also, if they have videos available, I don't encourage them to make a video, set the dog up so they can make you know, the video. But if they have one available, that's great. I can review that too. But like any behavior, the behavior is just behavior. What created that behavior? What is the root of the cause? So I really want to be interviewing them, finding out if we can figure out the root of what's going on. And it's interesting that you mentioned um, what's going on in the home because I spoke with a lady, oh, I was a couple weeks ago, and she had some aggression, inner home aggression with her dogs. And as we were speaking, I find out that the house is in turmoil. They're in the process of considering whether or not they're going to get a divorce. They have a very ill child in the home. They have college students coming in and out and in and out of the home, you know, regarding COVID. You know, they're coming in and out at different times when they normally would be away at school. <clears throat> and there's just a lot of pressure. And um, that pressure is definitely a component of what we're seeing in, in that dog. So if we can find that root cause, we need to change the, the root cause before we can change the behavior. And it's just working yeah. through that. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen, I totally agree with you. I see this all the time. I remember mm -hmm. um, I, I went actually to a person's house and I had a hard time getting in the house because the dog was so aggressive towards you know the new people. And I was like, why am I here? And I said, wait, it doesn't right. matter where I am. Like it was, it, it was literally next door. So I was like, yeah, you go yeah. over, help the neighbor kind of stuff. And I was like, right. no, let's do what I always do. Don't be biased here just mm -hmm. because it's your neighbor. You don't have to change what you do. So I went back home and said, right. hey, you know what, let's do it over the phone. And what I did basically during that conversation, I was recording through the small window what was going uh -huh. on there. So I pulled yeah. the video up. And said, this is what's happening in your house. And he's like, right. oh, my God, is that what I'm doing? It's like, yeah, you haven't seen it? Mm -hmm. He says, no, because yeah. I'm so busy with the dog. I don't see how messed up I am with my dog. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, you know, okay, let's sit down and talk about that. And the good thing, I think, mm -hmm. is with online training is that we have this time mm -hmm. and this safety. The dog mm -hmm. can hang out in this crate, can chew stuff, and you can have this right. quality time, share what you're struggling with. I want to hear right. your story. Right. I want to hear your story. Yeah. Sit down. Tell me your fears. Tell me what you're worried about. Tell me about your trauma because it always relates to how you behave based on your childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. I want right. to hear about that so I can see what your dog is expressing here. Right. And then mm -hmm. once we have that information, we laid out. So we have that behavior timeline. When did behavior mm -hmm. start? What's the dog's story? And now we look at right. the dog. What is the dog's story? Because what the people's stories and the dog's stories are two different things. Absolutely. Listen to the person, right? And we shouldn't just right. listen to the dog because both have stories. And all of a sudden, you discover that a dog has p 
PTSD too, and he has a trauma too. And the reason why he attacks his owner is because his owner behaves exactly like his previous owner behaved. So we have a pattern of a dog going into homes with similar behaviors, and those persons have always dogs with similar behaviors. Yeah. Does that show up at some point and says, hey, maybe we should deal with a deeper issue here, right? Well, and those people probably have the same issues with relationships that they're in, if you think about it, with with other humans, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we we have to recognize, even as a trainer, if we go there and, and talk to those people, we need to understand there is a dissociation of their real reality. And they live in this own personal world that is the old past is basically isolated so when we go in we do trigger stuff and i would highly recommend Mm -hmm. for you guys who are a little bit more advanced trainers and want to go look into doing online training as a full service professional you can contact judy you're doing workshops Mm -hmm. and classes right as well as a mentorships and Mm -hmm. um (laughs) hi steve steve is um (laughs) behaviorist and um did my mentoring program and he works with National Grid awesome. Research in, in Ohio. Oh, nice. And, yeah. nice. and um, yeah. we, we have programs that helps you as a professional going through this mm-hmm. process. And I want to t- tone out that we're not going into, hey, this is what I know and you know nothing as you have to join my mentorship. We totally are here kind of brainstorming. It's a new field. Right. There's not much science behind that yet. We see little, little like science catches up on this kind of stuff. Now, recently we have Mm -hmm. the scientific evidence that dogs are sentient beings, right? Mm -hmm. We know that, right? Yes, absolutely. And dogs do have emotions, kind of complex emotions. Mm -hmm. And we can compare them with a five-year-old having emotions. And I know talking about comparing dogs with children is a taboo in our world. Well, but that that really needs to change because we know now that there's so close to toddlers, I teach them like I teach toddlers. Right, and right. We, need to, we need to wake up, right? So yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. We have, we have to open up that box of Pandora and says, hey, we, have, we, we talk about for so many thousands of years, the dogs are family. I think a part of our dogs being, helping us in this evolutionary process have learned so much from us as much as we learned from them. I don't think we're going to would be here if we wouldn't have those dogs on our side. So we don't see dogs as derogatory. Oh yeah. Behaving like a dog kind of thing. No, I think ancient cultures had dog in such a high level that they have them Mm -hmm. as gods. I'm not, I'm not saying that direction is healthy either, but we have to see that something gone on that we totally missed the last couple of hundred years. We forgot about it. I don't know what happened to kind of a brainwashing situation, yeah. right? Where well, the dog and, became and a product. Yes. And, and I think too, you know, when you think about it, when I was a kid, we never took our dogs out for training classes. We never had trainers come in. Um, we treated the dog as if the dog was another member of the family. Of course, that was the culture in my family. My parents, my grandparents, they always felt like our pets were part of our family. Um, And I think that if we think of our pets as part of the family, a lot of the issues that we have are non-existent. Right. Because we're giving them that love, right? Yeah. I feel we, we, we missed the piece where animals are... Dogs are animals. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. They have these animal needs. Right. They have these breed traits and they have these emotional needs. And from outdoors, mm-hmm. that most of the dog was, they will have this freedom of movement. That freedom yeah. is being contained, contained, contained as we moved into closer cities and our personal need changed. So we took those mm-hmm. dogs in our home, closed the doors, closed the gates, closed the fence. And those public dogs and free roaming mm-hmm. dogs that were back in the past, where right. they went with the kids to school and they waited for the school bus to return. All of a sudden that become kind of an isolation and we become more yeah. resource guarding and that also expressed towards the dog's behavior. So the more we progress mm-hmm. to make dogs pets, the more those behaviors increase. So one part that right. we do online is basically educating people, telling them back the reality of the situations they're in. Hey, you have a dog that has needs has biological needs, has emotional needs, has breed trait needs. Right. If you don't fulfill those needs, it's kind of like having a fireman getting him off his job and locking him in a door and tell him you cannot do anything anymore in your life. The only thing you have to do is reading magazines. 
not fire right. magazines, just sport magazines. Right. He's gonna go nuts. Yeah. He's gonna start right. making fire himself, right? So we have yeah. to see that yeah. aspect. That our goal is not to troubleshoot situations in between dogs and humans. It's also we have to do the educational part that we're missing here. I think I don't right. know. I have a European culture. I don't know what your family mm -hmm. origin is, but we have a European culture that hundreds of years of dog training experience. And we just mm -hmm. have a, a different way of thinking when we talk about animals. We right. have we have a yeah. house dog. We don't have a pet. Yeah. A house dog belongs yeah. somewhere. Doesn't mean it's a mm -hmm. containment. Right. And right. We have right. I think we have to do that aspect. So um, tell me a little bit about mm -hmm. your training programs. Like if somebody wants to kind of look deeper into that aspect, yeah. how how does he get in touch with you? So um my online programs, I have programs for trainers and pet dog, um, pet dog parents. I, whichever term we choose to use, it's not going to be the term everybody likes, right? Um, and those programs work on helping you build those relationships and learning how to think in ways that are going to benefit our dog. I talk a lot about meeting needs because that's critically important. I talk about building up a secure bond with your dogs. And then I talk about teaching them using a more cognitive approach opposed to the strict obedience and the over controlling. Because one thing that's happened as houses, as dogs have lived in houses more, their choices are taken away. As you mentioned, they're not right, walking right. to the school bus. And so we have to find ways to address that. We have to find ways to give them choices so that they feel they have some control over their lives. And so I talk a lot about that as well and, um, you know, how to implement that. Now, with that said, having choices and um, giving dogs options like that does not mean it's permissiveness, okay? My dog does not have the choice to play in the street or to, you know, do something else that's unacceptable, unacceptable due to safety, safety mostly, but I do guide them in the right directions and I do give them choices and options as frequently as I can. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example of that. I had a dog one time that was older, Australian Shepherd, and I knew he wasn't feeling good. He had a lot of hair and I saw a sweater at a store one day and I'm like, this is cute. I'll take it home. I'll do the little, you know, funny Christmas sweater thing with my dog and I put it on him and he loved it. And so I went a couple days later and got a little fleecy pullover for him and I gave him the choice. Do you want to wear this one or this one? And those are little choices, but you know what? It's huge in the dog's world. I let them choose which protein food they eat. I let them choose where they walk on, go on walks, which harness they're going to wear. So there's so many ways to give them those choices. And interestingly enough, when we're talking about aggression, some of these techniques are enough to help these dogs feel more comfortable in their world. And not. <laughs> hold on, I hold on. <laughs> I'm going to be here, the, the bad lawyer. Okay. I was like, wait, okay. how do you know okay. the dog is aggressive? Well, okay, yeah. <laughs> As a determination of somebody else's right, definition. Right. So because let's talk I. About that a little bit. I Talk about what? I'm sorry. Let's talk about a little bit of aggression. What do people that you work with see in aggression and what you see in reality? Like, what's your reality about aggression? What's their reality about aggression? Aggression is a symptom of something else that's going on. Aggression in their eyes is a symptom because I, you know, I, I don't really see aggressive dogs. I see dogs that need help with something. And they're not getting that help. So aggression is one of those words I'm not real fond of. Um, a lot of people see reactivity as a strong aggression. That's fear in many cases. Of course, it's different with each dog. But let's really find out what the basis is. And that I don't label things aggression in those cases. Let's find out what's going on. Um, medical issues can often cause dogs to be a little grumpy. I guess I see grumpy more than aggressive because I don't see aggression. I just see dogs that are responding. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean negatively responding. I mean, they're just communicating, right? 
Con- Conrad Lawrence had a very interesting aspect about he he is a Nobel Prize um, mm-hmm. a person who wrote about a lot about dogs um, and animals and ducks. I know it doesn't seem to be related, but it is. Um, his mm-hmm. approach in helping people understand about imprinting and actually he wrote a whole book about aggression and one thing that really popped out he said that aggression is an important tool for an animal to survive we need aggression Mm -hmm. to survive it's part of what we we have to have aggression to get our food on the table at some point right you see that Mm -hmm. when the pandemic kicking everybody was aggressively collecting toilet paper rolls right oh yeah we are aggressively (laughs) locking our cars and defending our parking lots so it's kind of like we don't see aggression as something violent aggression is an expression right it's not a state of mind and so i would i would kind of help people understand that difference that mm-hmm. yes, your dog is aggressive, but it's not because he's his choice. He's it's not, not his being choice. mean. He's right. doing what's not he vicious and survive. doesn't want to send you a lesson per se, like oh, being a jerk right. today because I want to show you how bad you are. Um, yeah. And and I like the way you express it that we have to look into the root of it behind that. What is mm-hmm. that? And I, right. I see there is always a misconception. Right. My dog growled at me. Mm-hmm. He's aggressive. Yeah. He's going to kill my kids. How, how is this potential getting to that point? I feel there's right. a lot of misinformation out there. We have the scale of aggression. Mm-hmm. And so right. we, we go up there because the dog is aggressive. I think that's in itself is already a wrong approach. Instead of saying, hey, these are the yeah. signals the dog wants to avoid aggression. Yeah. I try and- to avoid. I try to avoid. I try to avoid. I hit the plafond or the top. Now I'm aggressive. But the latter is not it's, aggression, it's avoidance. It's avoidance, absolutely. And that, you know, that also factors in with our trigger stacking, right? If you think about it, it's like this, and then you can't deal with that, and then this happens. And it, it's really hard for them. And then we start labeling them, and we start calling them bad dogs because they're just trying to avoid a situation mm-hmm. where they're uncomfortable. How, how do you handle oh. empath- empathy? with the victim set of mind of people who have been beaten, who have yeah. you know, the neighbors suing them, animal control hitting the door. How, right. how do you deal with those guys online? I, you know, it, it's being empathetic with them and helping them understand that they're not a bad person because this or, you know, something happened with their dog. How can we help your dog? And that will help you. Um, I'm dealing with a situation right now where a neighbor called the police because the dog barked at uh, 11 o'clock in the morning or one o'clock in the afternoon, whatever, somewhere in that time zone, which is, it's okay for noise to happen at that time. And I worked really hard to explain to them that your dog is not a bad dog. This dog is just communicating. And so it's helping people understand and be empathetic with their dog too, because they're struggling, you know, they're having a hard time, something I wouldn't want the police knocking on my door about something that happened to my dog. So there's other emotions, right? And oftentimes it's out of that person's control. So we just have to work ahead from then. I'm empathetic with them. I, you know, I help them understand why it happened if we know. But, you know, we just have to, we have to be a little caring about the person we're working with too. And I see what? some trainers that they just jump in and try to fix the dog. Well, there's we aren't fixing, we're changing, right? We're changing what happened that caused the behavior to take place. Right, right. Um, mm-hmm. What are the tools that you use? Are you using shock collars, prong collars, choke collars, shake a can, spray bottles, anything? How do you do that? Like, I have never them? touched, well, I've never touched any of those things. So you hear a lot about crossover trainers. I cannot relate because I'm not one. And I can't relate to pain in any way. So pain, I would never use. I just use a whole lot of, I play games with dogs to teach them. I work a lot. Okay, as far as equipment, you're going to see a harness. You're going to see toys. You're going to see treats. That's oh, you it. want those cookie treat cutters? No, server? not me. No, <laughs> actually, I'll use them when I need them. But I do more treats to me. If I give a dog a treat, my dogs 
I, I have to open the cookie jar, remember where it even is, actually, because I'll give them what I call I love you treats. They're laying on the couch. They're cute. Oh, I just love you. Here's a treat. It's not a trade for doing something. There's not a reason why you get a treat. So if you sit, you get a treat. I don't work like that. I give my dog praise. We, you know, we kind of celebrate together. Yay, you caught that Frisbee. It was a big deal today because it was windy. We played Frisbee. So no, I don't push cookies. Not at all. They get them when they need them. Some dogs need that that cookie though to, to start being able to communicate or function with you or trust you. So one thing I do do with food is I do food sharing, which is amazing for getting that relationship started. I don't know if you've done that, but I'll take a bite of food and I'll give the dog the other bite of the food. And it's an, I, a sharing sometimes engagement. Sometimes I usually have the dog treats in my mouth sometimes. So like, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Oops. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll use, you know, something that I can eat too. <laughs> I, I like, I like your approach. I like your explanation. Um, I'm, I'm against stuck with treats because I see dogs have different kind of things that they want. Science basically confirms, and I'm not kind of a person who says, oh, science says that's what we do. Yeah, science yeah. is a supporting system. It helps us understand better about things. I, I, I wrote an article that dogs were tested to check in what are their preferences, which is kind of a cool experiment. So they had dogs yeah, getting cookies and dogs getting affection, which one they would like more. So the funny part was that dogs mm -hmm. equally liked affection, but they also liked treats. Yes. And so true. I said, you know what? I think this is a reality here because it depends on the dog what he perceives as a reward. And it's right. not because I have expensive or cheap treats is what I serve. It's mm -hmm. what the dog really sees as motivation. So I have right. my relationship as motivation, which mm -hmm. comes together with affection and reward, but it comes also with appreciation. Right. If you don't have this yeah. art space to appreciate your dog for giving you that little bit thing of achievement, your mm -hmm. dog will like, you know what? You're not appreciate what I'm doing. I'm going somewhere else. And how many right. people do you know who do things for not personal gain? and not money exactly. they have to do things right right people right. have lost right. dogs right for no money gain right. so they have this hard space so i i, I try to mm -hmm. tell them hey you don't need always food you have your affection right. you have your appreciation you can use markers right. your facial expression yeah. you don't need always the clicker right mm -hmm. but you can preach right. the word good and you said right. good boy i mean you're not a goat right. man just say a real good yeah. out of your heart instead of being a faking it and yeah. so you we have to be happy honest. boys and right, right. We we do have to be honest. And you know, I often times will see dogs have developed a relationship with the marker and the food, not with the person, because they're so nonstop. Click, give a treat, whistle, give a treat, whatever that that they turn off their emotions towards that dog, and they turn off the fun. And it becomes more of a stringent way of learning. And the, the relationship isn't there with the person. I My dogs do things because they know that I'm having fun with them. And I show, you know, enthusiasm and joy when they do something. Now, I see many trainers without pointing in any direction. Well, I do a little mm -hmm. bit. But um, <laughs> how can you address aggressive behavior if you're not punishing the dog for the bad behavior that he does? Well, punishment's just going to make the behavior worse. So the problem is we have to fix that underlying reason that the behavior happened. We have to turn whatever that negative is into a positive for the dog. If it's okay, so if it's a situation where the dog has had a bad experience that can result in aggressive type behavior. And I'll give you an example. I had a dog, my own dog, that I would walk. And one day a dog went through an electric fence and attacked him. He was eight months old. Eight months old is a very sensitive time for them. And for many, many years, he was scared of other dogs. Well, guess what? I never took another step in my neighborhood with my dog. I took him away. We went somewhere else and we walked and all was good. So we have to sometimes make those adjustments to help dogs get through the bad time. The P 
PTSD type feelings that they may or may not have. And there's a lot of discussion about that, right? So if you change what the setup was, what the root cause was, you can help the dog immensely. Um, what do you do for people? Let's say, for example, I had a client. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I had a client. I usually work with people who have guardian breeds. And so uh -huh. my are more guardian breeds and mastiff breeds people. Um, and of okay. course, you have all these questions. I'm 115 pounds and my dog weighs 250 pounds. I need a prong right. collar to walk that dog. And I was like, no, yeah. you don't. How do you get right. those people out of that mindset? And honestly, well, okay, let's be honest. If a lady is 70 mm -hmm. years old and has rheumatitis and her dog is pulling on mm -hmm. the leash, what do you do there? Right. You know, I'm a, a big believer in front attached harnesses. If if I have a client that's, you know, as you mentioned, I'll oftentimes go on walks with them. I will have them find another trainer in their area if they're out of my area or a dog walker to walk with them. So she's getting to walk with her dog, but she's not physically having to do it until we can work through some things. So then we go into just teaching the dog how to walk properly on the leash. To me, there's no excuse, no reason whatsoever, ever, for any aversive tool with working with a dog. We're going to find another way. And you know what? There's a lot of countries where you can't use some of those tools, and they find ways to deal with in, it, right? In Holland, they arrested two, two trainers for training police really? officers with a prong collar two years ago. And people Good. like... They're good. They're healthy. They're not doing any damage. I'm, we're not going to kind of in that direction. We have a whole session. Right. That what I recognized yeah. is that the 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 fear porn that those abusive mm -hmm. trainers use to make it look bad. Yeah. They come in, trigger your yeah. dog. Your dog shows nuts, and he's like, "How can you live with that dog? He's aggressive. He's gonna you're gonna lose your house. Mm -hmm. Your kids are gonna eat your kids. He's dominating right. your family." You have to over dominate right. him. You have to pee on his bed and you know choke him and oh. put him who's who's yeah. on, on the road. And, and and really there are a lot. I have no idea how many messages I get there. every day, and I literally have to hold space for it. And I'm burned out on that kind of stuff. So I, um, I am too. I saw that those people don't do the prep work. They don't educate the dog right. to begin with. Leash training right. doesn't, for example, the example we talk, leash training doesn't start on the street on a trigger. It starts in the no. house. And having the dog right. understanding the concepts. And I know yes. nobody of our viewers right now will learn the car by reading a book. No. It's set aside, no. No, play no. the little bit in the garage, push the button, mm -hmm. see what's going on. Right. And then, then yeah. slowly, slowly drive out their driveway, playing in the neighborhood before they went to the highway on a long trip. Why don't we do this on the dog? Why do we have to push them down the highway and then speeding them up to 250 miles an hour and see how they crash? Well, great. I, I, and we need to I chocolate think, to stop it. Well, and we've lived in a push button world, right? I want my television to turn on. I press the button from my chair. I don't get up and turn it on. And I think with our push button world, people think they are they should have push button dogs. They think that their dog should do things instantaneous, instantaneously. And I do see a lot of those trainers, first of all, guaranteeing results and telling people that they will get this dog trained in X amount of time, which is not often realistic. Um, but the other thing I find, they bully the dogs. They're also bullying and um, putting a big guilt trip on the pet owners and they are often afraid to say I'm not going to do that to my dog and the other disturbing thing is you know in this industry anybody can get a business card and call themselves an animal trainer right and so yeah. what you see is you see people without enough education these people shouldn't be out there but they're perceived as professionals and a lot of these places have huge buildings and huge advertising budgets. And what ends up happening is I don't have that huge advertising budget, right? I just have my name and years of experience and referrals. Um, but I don't look as professional because I don't have that TV commercial. And I'm not driving around in a vehicle with, you know, ads and everything. Right. So about Pauline human knows. perception. Paul Linux mm -hmm. is a colleague, uh, a behavior colleague from England. Mm -hmm. So we 
Hello, oh. England. Hi, Paul. England. <laughs> no, England, or am I wrong? I mean, Great Britain. Let's let's Great be Britain. more general. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, where, where are you guys watching us from? How about you give us a little bit of an update? Where are you watching us? And by the way, Paul, I totally agree with you. We have to do a positive associations with things because I have I have seen many people um, pushing the dogs into negative belief systems, and then. As a trainer, as a behaviorist, we have to deal with changing those negative belief systems on a dog. Oh, man. <laughs> Albany, New York. Great. <laughs> and I kind of shoot you all over. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I thought you were in Britain. Um, but anyway, the, the funny part was that people think that, oh, man, I lost my train of thoughts, um, that these negative associations we are a deal too. Mm -hmm. So we take the dog out for a walk on a leash and right. we make a left turn. And then we're gonna like, ah, oh. and then already we wrap our leashes around that. So the other good thing right. is on online training, we can observe those things. I usually do have people mm -hmm. or one of their, of their partners video record over distance from the inside of the car as they walk out the house, the whole process. So I can see it. Because it I'm not a psychic. A I don't know what you guys are doing at home, right? And I think you're good as well. You don't, you're not a psychic, are you? No, I wish I was. So Make our lives easier, right? <laughs> we need the video feedback of because yeah. what people say they do and what they actually do, they don't really are talking the reality. Well, because sometimes they don't see what they do. And if you show that video to them, they'll be like, oh man, I didn't know I did that. And right. so it makes a world of difference. Videos are amazing for that type of thing. Right. And I, I remember we had a session with a, with a client in the past. He has an indoor camera, you know, those super fancy mm -hmm. cameras that record everything yeah. in the house. So he was sitting on the couch and, oh, no, his wife was sitting on the couch and his dog was sitting next to him, next, next to her. Mm -hmm. And he got up, went around the couch, and the dog did that and then he attacked him and nobody mm. saw that yeah nobody everybody saw that. only they saw the video i says do you have video footage of the last behavior and she's like yeah let me pull right. it up so we watched that and says look at this mm -hmm. did you see that oh i didn't see that that's happening the yeah. dog would never show that if i would be there or you would be there because the dog would be busy with right. us so online that's training right. gives you so many tools mm -hmm. but as a, as a behaviorist you have to use those tools not against right. the dog and not against the client and not for your advantage. Right. Just because the exactly. dog's failed doesn't make you up the price. Just because these people struggling Absolutely. and have an autistic mm -hmm. child and you have to have more work doesn't mean your price goes up. No, it, it's, it's interesting that you talk about price because I have clients of various, you know, income ranges and living situations. I charge the same. I don't care if you're a major league you know, football player, or if you're, you know, a teacher in a school, I, I charge the same. So I, I see a lot of that too, with a lot of the aversive trainers, you know, the price just goes up. Oh, I know who that guy is. And I'm going right. to charge him more. And, you know, it's, it's crazy. Heck, I don't know half the time what my clients do. I, I went to a um, newscaster's house one day, I didn't even know he was on the news. So that shows you what I know, right? are a baseball player. So, you know, you have to treat everybody equally and right. everyone's situation is different, right? Every dog's different. I see I see many of my yeah. online clients being here online. I guess your clients too. Say hello to our mm -hmm. online clients, by the way. And you guys, yeah. how about you? Yeah, <laughs> hi. <laughs> we went yeah. through the process. We didn't trust you in the beginning. Um, That's I, right. I want to appreciate those because many of my clients, I have a, don I have a button on their checkout when they do on the online classes, mm -hmm. uh, online sessions. Yeah. And I have, they donate half of a session towards, oh. to other people. And oh. I add the other right. half, right? And okay. I, I have it there for a couple of, I think for a year or two, because I was thinking, okay, mm -hmm. some people want to pay forward and nobody paid right. forward. However, through COVID, right. everybody was, most mm -hmm. of them um, right. are paying forward. And all of a sudden I said, right. why did this person, why did this person paid extra what have, oh he donated another session so i collect those yeah. sessions for those people who don't have income or very low in income yeah. and so i add right. that 
to their packages. So I collect like three, nice. four sessions together and then I send them a package. Now, for example, I, like I work. I started yeah. yesterday working with Lane County Health Department. And so we have a special case of domestic mm -hmm. violence where this person, not only she has PTSD from her relationship, right. Not only she has to live in these difficult conditions in a hotel room, she actually cannot go to public because she has a trauma. How do you work with those people? Oh, yeah, okay. exactly. So exactly. Now we're working with a case uh, with a case manager, and we kind of found a plan. So we're going to do a hybrid right. session. We're going to start online so the you know client feels comfortable. Start teaching yeah. the dog a couple of skills because the dog has PTSD too. The person felt guilty Absolutely. because the dog had to stay with the abuser for a couple of months because she could pull the dog mm. out of there. And so right. they're all both traumatized. And so sometimes right. we have as a behaviorist or even online to cooperate mm -hmm. with specialists, yes. with a veterinarian, with a behavior, veterinary behaviors, with a nutritional, right. veterinary nutritionist. Absolutely. We have I, to work I, with a counselor, with a psychotherapist. Yes. I collaborate a lot with um, county departments, health departments with dog bite cases and even cases where I have to go to court on behalf of an animal for something that right, right. a family for something their animal did. Now we have to work together with people. I think um, one of the biggest things is working together with veterinarians too, because they don't have that behavior expertise unless you're a behaviorist. Right, right. So yeah, it's critically important. Um, what do you feel are the limitation online training? Can you work with any case, any situation, I have been able any client? I have been able to, with every one of the clients that I have worked with, it has been very successful. In fact, I think it's a lot more successful because I'm finding them more focused when I'm working with them. It seems like online people tend to focus even better. Now, I have a lot of clients that are comparing it to the school systems now. Well, the teachers have 30 people on a Zoom session with them. It's very hard to focus on an individual. We are having that, we're working with that person one-on-one -on -one, or, you know, the family. And it's been really successful. But I haven't really had any cases that were not successful doing virtual are not, you know, problems that have not been able to be changed or solved doing right. virtual. I, I, I remember really I had, had a couple of cases that were very tricky. Um, mm -hmm. And I have to admit over, I think I worked with already 2,500 clients online. Um, you you always have you know systems that not working well, but I don't think it right. was the online that made the difference. It was the really the cases were very very intense. Like the dog yeah. attacked one of the family members, and we were mm -hmm. able to stretch the the improve the quality of life of the dog, give him another two years, and then you know the health declined, and then the behaviors increased, and the, and then people have trauma yeah. from the old past things, and there are some right. things. No matter what you do, it will not end up well at some point. Doesn't mean you're a helpless case yeah. because you're improving the quality right. of life. And, and you know, helping those people overcome their trauma by finding a resolution right. to the issues and that make, case, makes a big difference. Yes. And the case you mentioned, it would not have been different if you would have been in person. It would have had the same outcome. Yeah, yeah. And so I feel what, you know, as an online trainer, we shouldn't feel guilty of not being successful. Mm -hmm. And I know I sometimes I have like moment I was like, man, maybe I should go go in person there. And then I yeah. asked myself, okay, what would you do different? I, I don't like disempowering people, taking away their power of that mm -hmm. relationship they have. As an online trainer, right. you're forced to give up that power to them and educate them how to use it and harness that power, Absolutely. that relationship power. And I think Right. This is why we don't use aversive tools because we don't rely mm -hmm. on those tools. We rely on the relationship because the dog, right. if he doesn't have a secure attachment relationship, he will show mm -hmm. behaviors just like any child. And we know exactly Absolutely. numbers shown that 32%, I think, for children don't mm -hmm. have a secure attachment relationship with their family wow. members. And unfortunately, dogs have the same amount of relationship percentage. So children mm -hmm. and dogs, 32% yeah. don't have secure attachment wow. relationship with their families. And we deal with those 32% of people mm -hmm. because otherwise right. that's a huge have number. Kind of problems, right? So we it's need a really we need scary number. It's a yeah. scary number. And yeah. we, we have yeah. to help people become aware that online 
is a safe way to go, but you cannot right. just do it just because you want right. to. Okay. So yes. tell me a little bit yeah. about your background. How were you able to handle those kind of online cases? Because you're not the person from yesterday. It was like, oh, today, yeah. because of COVID, I'm going to go yeah. online and going to make some money while the right. other ones can leave the house. You're not that kind of right. person. But how did you no, do that? No. What is your background? What, what tools do you use to get there? I, I do, as far as building those relationships and things, I use a lot of video, if, if, I mean, tools like that with, with my... So with Zoom, you can actually share another screen and I will have videos set up. I will demonstrate. I will have them demonstrate. We talk about, you know, just setups and, and how to set the environment up for the dog to succeed. And so those types of things really do help the online virtual learning because if I'm in their home, I'm going to be doing that behavior or showing that behavior with their dog, right? I'm building that relationship. I want them to build that relationship. Well, I can show it on a video screen of me doing that behavior with my dog and then they replicate it. And so they're, they're learning with their own dog. They're learning together and um, they're taking the responsibility for it. If I go into their home, it kind of falls on me. They start, right, you know, right. you just do it. You do it. I'll do it later. If that answered your question. It does. It does. Um, I want to grab mm -hmm. the opportunity to show a success story. It's not my success mm -hmm. story. It is my client, but it's okay. not my success story. And I think it's a representative what we do. We, we empower mm -hmm. people to step into their parenting power and help their animals transition from an aggressive behavior into a situation where they are safe and be able to handle them again like normal. So with your permission, I guess I'm going to share a short video. It's, it's one minute and 35 yeah. seconds. It's mm -hmm. a speed. It's a kind of a, a, a client of mine did it, which I really appreciate. Um, I see her almost like a colleague because she she worked with rescues a lot. She runs a rescue. Okay. And so let's 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 watch that a little bit. We, we can still talk in the background because it's it's kind of a sound and a little bit on a, on a description okay. in the background. While I try to figure here the systems, <laughs> so I have to. And you know, if story. I can say if I can say real quick um, while you're looking for that. When we do virtual, we empower them to change the behaviors themselves. And nothing is more empowering and no, more freeing than knowing that you can fix a problem. Right. For the right. meaning of pet parent or pet owner. So um, the little dog, uh, we worked with a mm -hmm. fake dog to associate um, and not every a attacking every dog that she sees. So we use the same color of the yeah. dog that she has her own dogs to help with the situation. Of course, we use the muzzle. So that was 100% online, even though I know yeah. these people in person. Awesome. Right. I love the fake dogs. So that was a year process. That was a rescue. Yeah, it's not a quick fix, but man, once you fix it, it's it's phenomenal. Right, right. No aversive tools. The only thing we use is yeah. a muzzle. Lots of training. Mm -hmm. Yes, lots of treats. Lots of body language learning uh -huh. on both sides. Yeah. I have to say, I cried over that video. That's great. Oh, I yes. That's awesome. That's a lot of work. It is. And it is. Wow. And we, what a we great have job. To, as the online trainers and behaviorists, we have to mm -hmm. um, be available. Our session doesn't start right. when the client push that button and our session doesn't stop when the client push that stop button. We have Absolutely. documents. We have to prepare documents. I think I have 120 documents mm -hmm. in my folder. I share a folder with my clients. Yeah. I think yeah. you also share videos with your clients so you guys can yeah. kind of talk about things because you, you right. have to prepare things for the clients. So mm -hmm. the more client sessions we have, the more data we have and we can use those data to educate. It's a right. very interactive um, 
conversation that we have. I can show mm -hmm. screen shares so we can show diagrams. Yeah. You cannot do that in person in the house. You have to have a whole folder with you and like laptop. And right. since you have a laptop, why right. don't you sit on the other side of the table? And here we go. We have already six feet distance, <laughs> right? And everything changes when you take a laptop into someone's home, if you think about it, because they're like, oh, you're dealing with a laptop and not me, right? So right, right. it makes it almost a negative to try to take that, those documents in and show them. And so in this way, it's not a negative. This is how we do it. And, um, you know, it's just, it's so much better all the way around, I think. From what yeah, I'm we seeing. have to now, make sure that. Go ahead. I, go ahead, because I, I have a different thought I was going to say real quick. Yeah, finish, finish your thought. It's more important. Okay, so what I've found all the time I've been doing virtual, I've only had one person that did not follow through and do a virtual appointment once I spoke with them on the phone. And that person was a school teacher who has 30 people on her Zoom and she couldn't understand it. She was a very emotional situation in my area right now with kids doing online school. It's very difficult. And right, right. so I think she was making that association too much. It's the only person that would not do one. And that's the only person, you know, that I haven't finished with her i just talked to her last yesterday you know it, yeah. may, it may turn out that she tries it but you know for the most part i think trainers could benefit so many more dogs if they would do virtual because you're not right. driving all over the place if you like guys you said, are listening to us mm -hmm. and you want to go the road and educate yourself about how to put online training services on your on your um, services page welcome to talk right. to us we can we see you as a colleague. We don't see you as like, yeah, you haven't been where we were kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. We need more people helping the community right now. It's not just about COVID. It's before COVID and we will continue after COVID too. It's the family right. that needs our help and to be educated as being more more persistent on their job, understanding mm -hmm. the animal needs, understand their, their parenting power and how to build those relationships, right. understanding that nutritional health and all these things are part of the whole system. And it's not just punishing mm -hmm. and cookie cutting, right? Right. So I really appreciate you today for being here and sharing. So please reach out to yeah. us. Let me share um, your website. Make sure that okay. everybody gets that. You guys can, of course, go back um, mm -hmm. into the description and see we have the website links on it. And, of course, here you can go also to my website. What is it? Here we go. Um, I lost myself. <laughs> but it's running on the today. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and if, if and, anyone wants ahead. to email me, it's Judy at understandingdogs.us. But they can Welcome also connect to, to the website. We have a link. So by the way, for Absolutely. you guys, kind of like quickly want to text message. Unfortunately, Judy exactly today has her husband working in the background, <laughs> fixing up the website a little bit. So be patient. Check in tomorrow. Eventually later yeah. tonight husband that's the message for you yeah um, hey. you know, <laughs> website and, and you know you always can ask a question okay you can ask a question okay. see how you mm -hmm. feel some people like to work um with special people who have a special you know presence on special you know feel good so some people would prefer females some people would prefer males some people don't really care some people want education yeah. some people want experience right Right. We are here to help you. And it's not just us. We are many people out there who work. So what I try here with my shows is basically making people aware of all those people who have that kind of an approach. So I and really you know, we can't, we can't see all the dogs. So we want to share our information so that other people can help the dogs and the families. And that's really what it's all about. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here today. How did you Thank like our you. show today? I'm running out of it's coffee. Fun. I can feel <laughs> oh no you better get loaded up <laughs> was so how was the audience how did you guys like our show today leave your message tell us what your story was if you had an in-person experience and if you had an online experience put it in the comments we likely will respond at some point um, judy and i will check in in our youtube and our facebook pages and kind of making sure that we answer all you guys questions i know you guys were into listening today and i didn't have so many questions but I'm hoping, Judy, it's up to you guys to invite Judy to come in and kind of share a couple of questions. Um, we can do a Q&A together, right? So thank yeah. you so much, everyone.
Talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oops.